I'm actually not going to tell you anything you don't already know. I'm, I'm sort of embarrassed. I'm, it, this is so logical, what I'm going to tell you, that you're going to shake your head, yeah, yeah, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is that not a whole lot of people, I think, are using this obvious idea. Goethe wrote, and I'm going to ask for the lights to come down, because I'm a photographer, and photographers are control freaks. <laughs> that which we know, we have first seen. Well, we're taking it a step further. That which we understand, we have first represented. Everything you're seeing here are representations of ideas. And I suggest that we're not paying enough attention to the making of the representation. I'm going to walk away, hopefully, with three ideas here. The process of making a representation clarifies your thinking. Duh. It's like writing a, a, an article. Thinking about how you're going to visually represent something clarifies it for you, and eventually, hopefully, for whom you're, to whom you're communicating. We also really feel deeply that the process of making a Representation should be collaborative, which I'll show you later. And finally, and more passionately for me, is that the process of making a representation teaches. Again, all obvious, but we're not doing it enough. So the first point in terms of the process of uh, making a representation clarifies your thinking. Take a look at this. You've seen this before, I hope. This fellow Darwin was making a representation of something that turned out to be pretty damn important. But look what he wrote up here, I think. He was making a visual representation of his thinking, which clarified ideas into something substantive, which we are hopefully continuing to discuss. Remember that making a representation involves representation. It is not the thing. An image or anything we're seeing on the screen, it is a representation of ideas. There is some sort of translation that has to be involved, interpretation that you have to make decisions about. And once again, this is this notion of clarification. Now, I'm going to run through unabashedly, some pictures that I made for George Whitesides in my book, No Small Matter. Not easy. This was a book, this is a book, which of course you're going to go out and buy. It's, a, it's Science on the Nanoscale. The idea was to find ways of representing science on this ridiculously small scale. And it wasn't just about making images about science. It was about making images that are metaphoric. And once again, most images are metaphoric, aren't they? So here's an image of an atomic force microscope tip. This is the way we see things that we cannot really see with our eyes, so we see it by measuring. This particular uh, instrument measures molecular forces, and we were trying to kind of express that in the book about how we feel, by, we, we see by feeling. The tip actually runs across a surface and feels the uh, forces between uh, the tip and the surface. And you know this pin art that you, know, you push your hand on? Well, this, is, this was the idea in the book to show how does the uh, atomic force micros microscopy work? How do we see it? Remember, we're reading data that is ultimately represented as an image. This is about light. This I came up with trying to... Does anyone see something not quite right in this picture? The shadow, right, is, is not quite right. You can, you're not going to get a square shadow. This is a metaphor of quantum mechanics. You know, yeah, sure, we're pushing it a bit. By the way, none of these pictures work without text. I mean, I am not an artist. I am a visual representer or whatever, whatever we're going to call myself today. But none of this stuff works without text. But it is trying to represent the counterintuitive aspect of quantum mechanics, which George writes about. Here we're talking about a drop. 
you know, there, that, that drop is a skin of nanoscience. That skin of molecules is about what happens on the molecular level. We talk about perhaps electron resonance, self-assembly, what our lives are all about. We wanted to talk about bacteria, etching with light. Anyone want to take a guess what you're looking at? Well, it's called Eleanor Rigby. It's a record. And we talk about how sound comes from record players. This is about a music box, which is binary. This is about photosynthesis. Ultimately, this notion of making a representation is collaborative if, when it's successful, as far as I'm concerned. This is why the book worked with me. We started quite a while ago, when I found this uh, data. It's really data. You're looking at numbers that have been represented as an image, and it wasn't um, labeled. And I realized I have to ask around what it is that we're looking at. It was in my, on my hard drive. Anyone want to take a guess of what you're seeing? I thought it was oceanographic. Well, it turns out it's the, it's the subsurface structure below a sunspot. The point of this is that we all are, in fact, representing ideas from various disciplines, and why not talk to each other about how we represent these ideas visually? So we started this conference, which turned into workshops, which have turned out to be more important, where we get people from various disciplines coming together, and you'd be surprised. They walk away thinking they've made a great representation in their minds, but not in terms of communicating with each other. For example, look at this. This is, a, this is an icon from Don Eigler. This is the way he represented a quantum corral. He actually was able in, at IBM to place these atoms in a corral. This is how they represented these numbers. These are numbers represented by an algorithm. But in the end, it wasn't quite right, because what we want to see is what's going on in the center of this corral. So maybe color was overused. You know, we, this is the kind of stuff we talk about. We talk about more than good enough. Here's an example of something I took off of the web. This is ferrofluid. This is my picture of ferrofluid. Hopefully you want to look at it and ask more questions. Here's the, what started me on this whole thing, is you're looking at a, a self-assembled monolayer. It's a surface with where the researcher put water, and it, there are lines that stop the water from spreading. Uh, that measures about four uh, millim millimeters across. This is their picture. It was used in the publication Science. This is my picture. What I'm doing is trying to communicate more what is going on. But ultimately, in, when we do this, we have got to be responsible in, a, in the way we represent ideas. When, take, a look at, take a real good look at the screen. Watch what I'm doing. I'm deleting the Petri dish in the yeast colony. Was I, able, was I permitted to do this? Well, I suggest that you look more carefully when I delete the Petri dish and see this amazing yeast colony with all these convolutions. Take a, a, keep, continue looking, and as I digitally delete the scratches with this image of a bacteria. Was I permitted to do that? This is the kind of conversations we have. Being responsible in our representations is primary. This is wrong. And we can go through a hundred reasons. No, maybe not a hundred, maybe five why it's wrong. But it's powerful. Representations are powerful, and we have to be responsible. And finally, it is no question in my mind that this whole notion of representing ideas teaches. When I made an image of nanotubes for our book, um, I first started with a printout on acetate of the nanotube structure. I, if you can imagine, I, I bended the acetate in order to make a cylinder. And in that process, I realized that I could attach the ends in various ways. And it happens that depending upon how you connect the ends, you have different conductivity uh, characteristics of the nanotube. 
It was teaching me something. Always I am learning. Ultimately, George wanted me to make the carbons more active, and, and if, let's say I wanted to make the carbon showing the electron density around the carbon. How do I do that? How should I represent that? It has, gets you to thinking. In our, in our project, Picturing to Learn, we are getting students to draw as if they were explaining to somebody else what various science is about. And in the process, although that's adorable, it's dead wrong. And what we, we have 3,000 drawings on our interactive site, which I invite you to come to by contacting me. You can filter through the drawings. You can see what's wrong with them. You could talk about metaphor and how metaphor works and where the metaphor falls apart. This is all highly interactive, and you're not going to believe some of these amazing drawings that are not great. And in the end, the idea is to collaborate, get, get kids to collaborate, bring it to high schools, as we're trying to do, and talk about all these questions. How do you represent all this stuff? Because in the end, it cultivates critical thinking.